behold, a pale horse. The man who sat on him was dead. And hell followed with him. You're killing me, man. Welcome to Declarations of War, FanFest 2023 edition. I am your host, Alexav Carr, joined by my faithful co-host, Zero Cool. Hello, hello. And Levitain. G'day, 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 g'day. Our special guest today is Lucas Armanelos, the CEO of Rude, rapid unscheduled assembly of Kybernauts Clade. Hello, hello. If you're not familiar with Kybernauts Clade, they're one of the top triglaving groups in Pochvin, and we are extremely excited to have Lucas here with us today. Yeah, Our thank, top you, story thank you guys for him. Sorry. Yeah, of course. Our top story is going to be FanFest, guys. Uh, normally we kick the show off with interviewing, but we've got to talk about this. A lot of big news has dropped, and let's get right into it. First announcement, kind of a techie thing, but I've been reading more and more about it, and I think it might be more impactful than it might seem given the relative hype around other FanFest announcements. But we're going to be upgrading the EVE code base, server cluster, something from Python 2 to Python 3. Uh, my understanding is this will greatly increase the efficiency of EVE in general, possibly to the point of reducing tie-dye. Yes, I, I tried my best Alec, to follow along with what was being said about this. I mean, I'm, you know, somebody with a computing background, nowhere near the level of computing background that many of my corp mates and alliance mates and other people I've met and Eve have. I don't work in IT, but, you know, I tried to follow along and it really sounded like there's sort of multiple different systems that they use. And one of them has this massive effect on uh, sort of tie-dye communications then or fight-based communications with it, between clients and server. And yeah, it sounded really promising. My understanding is one of the big issues with tie-dye still being a thing is that Eve just has a single thread client. So there's some... There's some technical limit to how fast the single thread can go. And to get it multi-threaded would be to basically have to rewrite the client from the ground up, or rewrite the architecture from the ground up. How much do you think we could actually see in terms of performance improvement from this code base upgrade without that full rewrite? Or is that something we just don't know? You know, from what I heard, uh, you know, and what they said, it was to do with those, um, I, I, I wouldn't like to sort of pretend that I could know enough to, to really go into this, but it sounded like, for me at least, like it would be two thirds quicker, roughly. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously this is all, you know, speculation and like down, down to them to sort of execute on, but it really did sound like they were making some significant efficiency type savings uh, in those sort of data communications. If it only gets one third faster, that would be pretty drastic. I think there'll always be a limit. I think just to the complexity of Eve, I mean, no, no other game out there allows potentially two to three thousand players on each team to duke it out, and just the amount the server has to take. I think even with a multi-threaded client, um, it would still struggle under those particular numbers. But it's always great to see that they're, 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 they're not like you know they're supporting the game they're, they're trying to make things better and any any better way of blowing up spaceships all for it and i mean eve players have a very long and storied history of figuring out just how much the server can take and finding a way to push it right up to the line if not over the line no matter how many upgrades they do for it they could allow three thousand people to be on one grid and three thousand on another grid in the same system come together have a six thousand person fight and EVE players would just want 12,000 in system instead. Yeah, and then, no, and then they nope. would all pop fighters. Yeah, and drones, and suddenly every ship's controlling five drones with its own vectors and its own kind of stuff like that. And it just, there's no other game that comes close to that, te that technical. I don't know any other game that allows that numbers with that many variables. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Speaking of beautiful... We're getting upgraded skins. Uh, they have finally listened to the community's repeated postings on Reddit and have officially partnered with T Amber 
to get us like really top end skins. The first of which is going to be available in the collector's edition, the Megathron skin. Uh, but they teased a couple others as well. I believe Reddit, his name is Kaldari Prime Pony Club. So if you've seen him posting around, you've probably seen some of these amazing fit concepts, excuse me, skin concepts that he's put out. And everyone was like, CCP, why aren't you getting this? CCP, why aren't you partnering with them? Get these skins in the game. Let's go. It's finally happening. I think the only thing that really takes the sting out of this skins-related announcement is the later announcements. That I think it was the following day where they, they were saying that soon, hopefully, uh, within the next 18 months then, players will be able to kind of use the Skinner tool on ships and then kind of create their own skins and then have to buy them with Plex, which I thought was interesting. Uh, they then sort of teased Katia's and then decided to say, sorry, just kidding, um, which I thought was a little bit cruel. They teased having anime decals on the ships and had to walk that back as well. Oh, Heartbroken. <laughs> I just want to Many put like years. JoJo stuff on my on my ships. Is that so much? How many years has it been now that Eve community has been as for players? I haven't really touched the Skinner tool myself because we don't have any uh, Citadels up right now. But some corps in our alliance do, so I've seen what can be done with it. The Hadley's HQ looks fantastic it's like decked out in glinty authentic skin color combination it did the skins lapsed and i think it's just it's oh. like 1.2 million ever marks per month it's it's something grossly insane how granular is this tool like uh, could you use could you make decals and can you make Not it really uh, oh, okay that's something they tease basically uh, just a color picker yeah, they teased having sort of Alliance logo as a decal on like your Astro House or whatever um, as part of the next sort of iteration of this, the next phase. Not that perhaps the immediate one come in, but, you know, some sort of iterations further down the line. Yeah, there was this game I remember called All Points Bulletin, and uh, it was famous for the customization you could do. And uh, you could, it was very granular customization where you could uh, create pretty much any shape and people just went crazy with it. And yeah, you you had some crazy stuff. Like I remember seeing uh, the Gordon Freeman like skin from uh, Half-Life in that game. Somebody was wearing that suit. Wow. Were there dicks? And if so, what was the TTP? <laughs> very low but yeah like if, uh, if yeah, yeah if ccp did something like that you know, you you know people would start making all kinds of like anime skins and like ponies and whatever for the uninitiated ttp is time to penis it is the amount of time when you release any kind of custom graphic software or anything that allows people to draw things to the time when they use it to create a dick it's usually pretty low <laughs> well i'm really looking forward to it um i'm a big skins guy as the audience knows i'll buy tons of them i dropped a lot of plex recently they had sales on a lot of skins where they were 5 10 20 25 plex a piece so i picked up a whole bunch um most of the time I'll, I'll buy one skin for a ship and i'll just roll with that all the time but every once in a while i'll want to switch it up so the ship does have a particularly good skin variant. It's cheap enough. I just like to pick it up so I have the option. Show off all my cool stuff. I love the Tiamber skins that I've seen on Reddit, so I can't wait to get a hold of them. And patterns for structures also seems interesting. Oh, yeah. I don't know exactly what that'll be, but you know, it'll I'm sure it'll be cool. That, that Megathron skin they showed off was really, really nice looking. Oh, it's amazing. If you have, if you guys haven't seen it yet, go check it out. It's white with kind of gold highlights in the front of it, almost like, a, I don't know, like falling stars or something. It's quite beautiful. I'm just glad that when these sort of skins come around and the ones you can customize yourself as well, they can be shared among people because I'm not the most creative when it comes to things like that. Mm. 
Yeah, that would be it would almost create a skin maker economy within the game, which I think would be really smart on CCP's part. Save them a lot of work and make them a lot of money. I mean, those kind of skins have, have existed. I mean, um, when Singularity, sorry, the, the Chinese, sorry, Serenity, the Chinese server, often had their own kind of skins, which usually were, were really fancy compared to the TQ ones. So it would be nice to see some some more eye candy looking skins, you know, stuff that makes you think, "Wow, I like to fly that ship in decent graphics," just to see it. And if you're going to be on an op that's hours long, staring at the butt of the same ship that entire time, it might as well look attractive. When are we going to get like colored engine uh, engine lights? Why isn't that a thing? Well, they were talking a lot about um, the, the volumetric cloud work they've done, right? So, in, it's really like looks truly like um, volumetric clouds that catch light and uh, would potentially catch light of different color engines, uh, that kind of thing. And I can imagine spending a lot more time zoomed in uh, as my time in Eve goes on. Uh, whereas, you know, I used to learn to zoom out a lot. Yeah, I realized I play the game more zoomed in than most players, at least most players in my age range. I like to know where my ship is pointing for various reasons. I do a lot of, like, zoom outs and then come back in kind of thing rather than just keeping it in one perspective. Whereas I think most players, at least the videos that I watch or players that I talk to, they do some of that, but for the most part, they keep it pretty zoomed out and just stay there or they keep it pretty zoomed in and just stay there. Yeah, something I'm playing with more and more, sort of, uh, especially now that you've started uh, putting the damage type effects on the missiles and the torps and things. I spend more time zooming in, and especially now, you know, moving on to trying to identify guns and things as well, failing miserably sometimes. We're going to have a lot of more stuff to identify. We're getting some new ships added to the game. Zero, why don't you talk to us about the big meat of the announcements, the Havoc expansion? Yeah, so uh, for me, I was just, I, I mentioned this on a few shows ago, you know, the ideal would be for me that we would have more space to explore, that that space would bring some new type of content, um, and that it would involve a connection to the Jove and, and different things like this. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of exceeded my expectations, really. I mean, you know, they opened up uh, Zarzak uh, during FanFest. Um, that was very exciting to see. It happened, you know, in client, uh, on, the, on the big stage. Um, looks a bit like uh, a strange mix of low sec with its own kind of concord type system to have uh, to come as well as having some sort of like arena kind of mechanics almost like you'd get when you're playing in the tournaments right where you've got uh, you know an, a, a boundary then and um when you're practicing for tournaments that boundary is invisible but uh, when you're playing in the in the tournaments or when you you know, look at these sort of things in, in abyssal space or uh, or what have you. There is a sort of visible um, effect that you can see. And they, and they showed that off and they showed that, you know, outside of these boundaries around gates and systems in Zarzak, you, you know, you'll take uh, hell damage to the point where, you know, any ship you've got, no matter how well it's tanked, will will die if you stay out there too long. Uh, it's going to be, it, it, it looked like it was sort of designed for PvP. Uh, for me, you know, it was it was almost like a Thunderdome kind of environment, which is basically what happens uh, in, in the time after the announcement and the gates opened, right? People just start shooting each other in there. They did indeed, and we wouldn't be left out of it. So I took a fleet over just to see what was going on. Uh, it was super busy, as you might imagine. Um, the station, which is not dockable, seemed to be the main place people were meleeing as opposed to the gates. So you'd have people coming in through the gates, they'd be warping to the station, and the station was just a, a big thunderdome of various solarers and small fleets trying to scrap with each other. Uh, we were the top dogs for a little bit, until we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I think we did come out ahead on kills slightly, but it was mostly just for fun, just to check it out. Uh, but no, no bookmarking, no combat probing. Basically nothing to see outside of the gates in the station that you could successfully get to. And we did come close to that barrier. Uh, the graphic for the barrier is very, very cool. It kind of gives you like a shimmering hexagonal look to it. And we didn't go outside of it, but it came pretty close. And then I had to, 
to turn us around. The, you know, just the, the station geography and the way it, your orbit command interacts. I didn't realize how far from the skin we actually were. Yeah, <laughs> it got a little spicy for a second, but it turned us right around. We were fine. Apparently, it will apply percentage hull damage. So no matter how big your ship is or how heavily you hull tank it, it will drop. And I believe that percentage scales up over time. But I think there's also a slight delay to when it starts. So it's not like if you cross, it's like stick your toe over the line, you'll immediately get a nuke. There's a bit of wind up to it. Kind of similar to uh, Abyssal Space, probably. Yeah, just much more slowed down, right? Because in Abyssal Space, you're kind of nuked within seconds, whereas this gave you, you know, a good 30 seconds, it, it seemed at least, to kind of play about in that that area and then come back in. Yeah, about the whole damage. Uh, uh, it was really funny when they were demonstrating the whole damage effect, and they almost lost the Polaris frigate outside of the bubble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not for the faint of heart, that system. Um, but yeah, it, and it looks... Cool. It looks amazing, right? I mean, it looks so pretty. It's very bright. Uh, it's sort of on the edge of a black hole. It's just they've really uh, tried to make it dark but light at the same time. Very interesting. Very good. The black hole is cool. I think it, it probably could be... Like, they could have made it bigger or scarier looking, but I think then you would lose some of the plausibility of it not, like, sucking in everything around it. But for the station being at a relatively safe distance from it but still having a compelling graphic, we thought they nailed it as far as the size and the placement and the effects around it. And I'm sure they're going to do a lot more with it over time. So it wasn't as just... Far as, uh, it doesn't really do any like wormhole gravitational effects. Like the black hole wormhole effect. Uh, not, Nothing yet. Not, not yet, at least. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we could... They did say that they would slowly release more and more um, features then or, or facts about Zazak that would affect us going forward, leading up to the expansion, which uh, I thought was cool. Also very cool is the way the gates are arranged. This is, I think, the most controversial aspect to it. Uh, it connects the east and west and north and south of the map, essentially. Um, connects Curse to... Uh, Venal. Yeah, Curse to Venal, and then it connects Placid to Turner. I forget which region that is. Mimitar space. Yeah, it's one of the Mimitar it... regions. Which Turner That's itself tiny. is a low sec version of Thera with a lot of wormhole connections. So this is an extremely accessible system that makes the map feel a lot smaller in certain ways. Now that said, you do have to pay an ISK charge to get through the gates to Zarzak. So. <laughs> plan on moving battleships or cap ships through it'll get quite expensive pretty fast we moved harbingers through and they were almost a million isk apiece wow will add up pretty fast but i think if you're going with like salt frigates or something it's a very affordable option for you to travel really fast yeah there's definitely concerns about uh, the geography kind of becoming more less and less meaningful in the game because uh one of the greatest and, and we're we're going to talk about this later as well one of the greatest things uh, for being in the southeast recently was that uh, it was kind of an isolated space no sec blocks didn't have uh, the anti blacks connections to that space and because of that uh, because it's like an isolated space for people of smaller groups well, they could actually play properly with each other, I would say, and actually use the big toys that they wanted to use. And like the geography becoming less and less of a factor for groups and being able to cover longer and longer distances like this, definitely, I think, uh, will be uh, an issue or maybe maybe even a problem at some point. Because, but yeah, we'll, I guess we'll see what uh, what will happen. I mean, the other thing they announced, of course, was the the ships that are going to come along with this new faction, um, the uh, the Deathless faction, which is going to sort of snuggle up to the Angel Cartel, the Garistas, and produce some new destroyers, right? Um, some new battle cruisers, 
and the long-awaited Angel Titan. Indeed. A lot of people hype for the Angel Titan. I am personally more hyped for the Angel, or excuse me, the Sir Drista Battle Cruiser, the Alligator. Mm. Oh. I mean, it's not too far off of Gila, but it just, I love a Drake, and it's basically a souped up Drake. I personally am excited for the Angel Battle Cruiser. I was told it's going to have a top, it's going to have a speed of about 3.5k and pretty, very decent damage. So I think we can, for Portrait specifically, I'm very excited for it. Yeah. Go ahead. I know, just looking, I mean, so the Kisriel, which is the, the, the Battle Cruiser itself. So looking at the bonuses, I, pretty much follows all the angel ships in having, you know, rate of fire and damage, which is like the old style, which is like a, a hurricane. And with six guns on there, it's going to have a hurricane of a DPS, but you're also getting 50% fall off. You're also getting the warp speed, which should mean that this thing has a base warp speed of around about four and four and a half or four and a bit AU a second. So these things are going to be fast. And as you say, from a speed point of view and maneuverability point of view, these things should be able to nano very easily. What do you guys think the Angel Titan is going to be used for? Because it has a lot of the same features, tracking speed, damage, fall off. Um, it gets the warp speed bonus, also a bonus to warp acceleration, which is rare on a, capa- on a cap ship. Um, that's novel. Um, could be like a hit and run sniping platform, which definitely that would be new ground for a Titan. That's nano rag, isn't it? Basically, so that this this would ideally replace the nano rag um, because you get even more warp speed on top of uh, your rigs and your ascendancies. Yeah, and no need to gonna... siege to get the damage. Yeah, oh, I guess rag wouldn't have that anyway. Sorry, go ahead, Luca. Yeah, I was gonna say you're gonna be even more slippery than a nano rag, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you have been following, there's this person called Cracket. He has been uploading videos of his Ragnarok in Horde space, I think was it. And what he does is just he fights the Marauders ratting, and he has a Ragnarok fitted with artillery guns. And he just finds the Marauders, who warps onto onto him with a Titan, and just one-shots them in the leaves. The alligator's DPS, I think I calculated earlier itself. So, yeah, it's like a key there on steroids. You lose the range of a Drake. EHP is equivalent to a DNI. So, in terms of a, in terms of a DPS wise, it, it's very similar to that. Uh, but, oh, sorry, EHP. But DPS, this thing can break a thousand DPS a second very happily with hams and drones. It's, it's incredible, isn't it? It's going to have like the DPS of a of an exec navy but at further range and more tank and just oh it's just going to be application wise i think with the drones medium drones oh i don't know and no one's really talking about it yet but that 12.5 percent velocity bonus to the drones yeah like you don't appreciate how nice that is but that means you are able to kill a wider range of targets with those medium drones. You'll actually be able to threaten a lot of frigates with them. And it'll be uh, a big boon to one of the most annoying parts of a drone comp, which is the travel time between your primaries. It's worth bearing in mind the Gila does not get that bonus. So mm-hmm. you'll have drones even faster than a Gila. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried from the like Pochfen point of view because Pochfen is um, plagued by drone comps and like having we already have like Ishtars everywhere and Gilas everywhere and this like stronger drone ship uh, in Pochfen is gonna be definitely interesting to see unless we will definitely have to find a counterplay, counterplay for it I guess it'll come down to price but I would imagine with these things being available in a loyalty point store that will be probably very popular I don't think they're going to be terribly much more expensive than the Gila, which, you know, given that speed bonus, why would you want the Gila over this thing? For any PvE purposes, it's going to be so much more efficient. I think your uh, 100 MN Gila fleets will still be a thing, but the Gator might do that almost as good, 
people might might want it more. I don't know. It's going to have battle cruiser size SIG, so that is going to be the major drawback there. It's not going to be as fast or elusive against larger guns as the Gila. It's going to be a shield ship, which will be. Re- there's only a few battle cruisers that can 100 MN effectively. Yeah, this this probably won't be one of them. It's also going to be interesting for the NullSec meta because currently the it's the progression from what I know, like Ishtar and Gila are sort of similar. You usually go for Gila first and then Ishtar. And uh, it used to be that Rattlesnake was like an upgrade from Gila, but uh, currently it's just cost too much. And we'll see how the price... Uh, what uh, what the build price will be for the ship and like how, how expensive it will be. But um, I hope uh, that we get those uh, Gorista's battle cruisers out writing in Nullsec. It's also what are you seeing but... for the, uh, the destroyers? We haven't really talked about them yet. I think Faction Warfare is clearly going to be the place where they shine the brightest, but... It's a game of two halves, I think, with the destroyers. So the Goristas is the Mamba. It's, it's like a fat um, uh, worm, but it lacks a little bit of what the worms has, which is speed and, and, and kind of signature, whereas the Mamba, it's going to be really heavy. There's no two ways about it. This thing is going to be a tanky boy. But its DPS isn't that much of an upgrade on compared to a worm, and you're a destroyer with shield tanks, so you're going to get applied to by cruisers, which are everywhere in the battlefield. So um, the Mamba is okay. The uh, the Angel Cartel one, I think, could be really interesting because you can that that is such a flexible ship. It has a fifty meter signature, and the ten and M fit works hilariously well with that thing as well. And of course, you can see it as an artillery snipey platform, as well as an up close and in your face brawler like a flasher is. So that one's got a lot of different configurations. I'm more interested for the Angel one than anything. Do you guys have any concerns? Because from what I know. Worm is considered pretty much unfightable one-on-one uh, in factional warfare. In a frigate point of view, yeah, I'd agree. Um, but one, one of the reasons we don't really see the worm that much, and this may obviously change with Havoc, um, is that a lot of the sites in faction warfare are now quite Navy-centric, which blocks out T2 and Pirate. So you don't see these things nearly... You almost never see them now in the, bat, in the war zone anymore because not a lot of the sites have them. It is interesting, isn't it, that, you know, these Garistas and Angels um, are going to join Faction Warfare as the pirate group. You know, will it be that people fighting for the Angels, Garistas slash Deathless are going to want to use pirate ships, right? Uh, if, they, if they're if they not able to with the sights and things, then then uh, that might be a bit of a mismatch in, in people's sort of, uh, you know, head cannon and their, you know, immersion. Um, I wonder if we're going to see they did they did try to increase the availability of pirate related sites in faction warfare at the recent patch didn't they does that translate it into any meaningful um return to five pirate cruisers in into nah. faction warfare space no but it's not really a huge massive change i think if they've got different sites coming in from havoc then yeah these are almost certainly going to be advanced sites which allows your t2s and your pirates in there itself i wonder if one of the things you might see is when they corrupt the system or start to go in that all the sites immediately become you know that become like advanced so that they can get into the sites and cause a bit of problems hmm I mean, we've definitely seen more advance, but it hasn't really shifted the meta of faction warfare in general. Pirate cruisers are still pretty rare. Tech 2 cruisers are slightly more common than they used to be, but most people are still just sticking with navies like they were before. Yeah, the engagement profile, like a cyclone fleet, issue fleet, real ospreys and sives, it gets into every site. There's no reason. So. What do you think of these Ford operating bases that uh, are going to be the starting point for this uh, Angels, Garistas, slash Deathless uh, foray into Faction Warfare? So according to the notes we have here, thank you, Zero, um, it'll be some kind of system effect. We don't know what exactly. Um, it will somehow change the rules of the system or the effects of the system, but they haven't really gone into detail about that. 
We know that it will be centered around the forward operating base, potentially up to three jumps, or is that just the starting point zero? So the forward operating base is chosen um, by, they said, either AI or uh, uh, some other factor is going to cha- choose the forward operating base. Um, that will be uh, the starting point for the uh, incursion, in a sense. They didn't use the word incursion, but that's the kind of, I think it's obvious why they're not using that word specifically. But that's the type of mechanic we're talking about. And once the forward operating base system is established, immediately every other system within three jumps of that is also sort of corrupted in a, in a sort of secondary effect. Um, and that can spread depending on how quickly people uh, sort of meet the objectives of the sort of race to the prize sort of system they got going on. Is it going to be similar to storm effects where uh, you have like a main system with the stronger effects and the further out you go, it, the effect gets weaker? At the moment, yeah, it seems like there's going to be two stages to it. The effect in the forward operating base and then the effect in the uh, the other systems, the three jumps out. But then it looks like you can sort of focus on a system and make those effects or uh, increase different amounts of effects or increase the strength. We're not sure yet which, but people uh, doing this will be able to target different systems and say, oh, we're going to try and corrupt this specific system because it's going to have, you know, uh, lasting effects that are beneficial to us. Uh, again, we don't know what those effects are going to be yet, but they did hint, uh, well, they more than hinted, they confirmed that, you know, if, if it happens in a high-sec system, it'll make that system potentially more like low-sec. And if it happens in a low-sec system, that'll make it more potentially like like null-sec type rules. Now, how, how permanent that's going to be or or things like that, we're not sure yet, but it's, that's, it's, it's along those lines of those sort of legacy board game type mechanics where, you know, the player's actions can more permanently affect the board. The, and in our sense, you know, the board being the systems. Yeah, I personally, uh, I already told Zero about this, but I personally really like these new directions CCP has been going in where they create or they have created mechanics in the past and they are now repurposing those mechanics in a different and new and exciting way because the security status change mechanic was made in the Troglavian invasions back in like 2019 I think or 2020 and uh, it seems like they're all reusing those mechanics right now in a different way which is I think is really really cool that uh, CCP is focusing on game mechanics specifically and using those mechanics in a novel ways. I think the uh, other element of this is CCP using LOSEC kind of as a bit of a experiment area, trying some things. So they've explicitly at several points, both this FanFest and the previous one, mentioned that a lot of the systems we're seeing in Faction Warfare will likely make their way into NullSec at some point. I would presume as some kind of update to the SOP system. They pointed that out a few times during FanFest this year in diff- at different points that that's the direction things are headed in, that these mechanics will find their way into solve null at some point in some fashion. The system corruption element, if you take it to, to the level of what, if you were to apply it to SOV, Maybe we can reverse engineer then what some of the system effects might be. Uh, Given it's pirate, I would say adjusting the security status of the system is definitely not outside the realm of possibility. You can see corrupted systems get get lower in their effective security, which would increase the value of the belt rats, among other things. Maybe we see security guns turn off for pirates. Maybe it's... uh, new kinds of rats or anomalies spawning if a system is more corrupted. Or it could literally be system effects like wormholes. Or something totally different that we haven't thought of. But you know, if I'm thinking about terraforming a system in a null sex context, adjusting what spawns, adjusting the level of security, the established uh, established power in that system, in this case NPCs, but in the future players, could have both of those come to mind. That would make uh, map way more fluid, I think, because currently we have uh, 
more static map where the security status of the systems are set in and don't really change, no matter how how many pirates you kill in the system. But yeah, that could uh, be very interesting. Well, the other big announcement at FanFest, besides the, all the stuff in the Havoc patch, is something that's kind of related to Havoc, at least lore-wise. The station in Zarzak is apparently chocked full of new Vanguard combat clones, which we'll use for the Vanguard game. This will be a FPS, presumably multi-platform, but at minimum it was demoed on a PC, I believe. They weren't they weren't perfectly clear on what it was being demoed on, but they did say that it would have a PC uh, connection in some way. It will basically be Dust 514, but updated for modern graphics and tied into this new pirate faction warfare corruption system. I think the hype is pretty strong for this. I talked to the folks over at our sister podcast of um, Federation Frontline, and the word there on the street, like the... The, the attitude on the floor of FanFest after those announcements. People were actually pretty positive about it. They liked what they saw, and they liked what they're hearing from the developers around it. I rewatched the reveal earlier, and it's clear that the the audience, you know, it was almost the last thing they were expecting was the actual announcement of something that's already been announced softly, right? I mean, there have been job adverts out for forever, uh, for London-based, you know, FPS CCP game, they've mentioned in previous fan fest that they're doing this. Yet the announcement comes, you know, it was coming along in dribs and drabs. Um, the, the the screen came up, uh, Dust Five One Four, and the audience just went silent. You could tell they were waiting for disappointment, uh, as in, you know, nothing really come in, and then suddenly we're faced with, oh, in December you'll get to do this. Yeah, signups are were available. Could literally go to the website and put your name in for the alpha demo. I'm obviously not actually able to play it yet, but you could register, which is cool. As far as the actual gameplay, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. I I appreciate it was pre-alpha, so you know there's a lot about the game that's yet to be finished. It looked kind of uh, gray to me. I don't have it may have it's just my boomer reflexes, but like I could barely see what was going on or what people were shooting at. But it did look functional and it did look cool. And it definitely looked kind of that grim dark Eve feel. I love that they're launching it with a connection to Eve again and that they haven't given up on that idea. Um but other than that I don't I don't really know if I'm best positioned to give a good reaction to this because I'm not a huge FPS guy. Yeah, I think that that might be common among many Eve players. Um, but how would you, you know? I think I'm sure we'd all love it if it was a good a game with a good loop, good game play loop, and people enjoyed doing it. And the economy, you know, maybe it was a viable source of income for you, you know, if you wanted to do that sort of thing in Eve, uh, and and would impact Eve as well. They they did say they would sort of temper how much of of an economic connection they would be between Vanguard and Eve initially to protect from, I don't know, you know, the exploits potentially that could be there. But uh, I, I definitely will give it a go, right? I mean, no doubt about it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of, of um, first-person shooters, but interestingly, they seem to have, you know, that Eve, rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, every other iteration of the wheel of, of different ways of uh, approaching something kind of mechanic going on. You know, you had your kinetic weapons, you had energy weapons, you had different types of resistances, uh, that kind of thing. So, and, and of course, the, the sort of full loot, uh, hardcore kind of, uh, you know, sort of work together or betray each other up to you kind of mechanics. At the very least, it'll be something to do when you're waiting for a timer or everything's tie-dyed to hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I guess I'll... Like it was instead of taking a book out, basically, while you're trying to warp your dreadnought from point A to point B, you can uh, go pop in for some Vanguard rounds. <laughs> yeah, I'll be. I mean, it's PC based. It's Eve connected. Even if I don't play it a ton, I'm definitely going to download it and give it a shot. 
a actual Eve feature that I haven't really messed around much with because of some of the features it was missing that they just announced is the upgraded corp projects. Corp projects have apparently been extremely popular as a feature, which I'm not surprised about. And they're going to add automatic payments. For me, this is the big thing holding it back because otherwise it's just sort of an in-game spreadsheet tracker, but you still have to do all the actual administrative work manually. This is interesting, though. You can set up a corp project and give it some kind of payment criteria. So when the project completes, people get paid out depending on their contributions. That is a massive, massive feature add. Also very cool, they're adding goals for logistics pilots, which means a great way to reward pilots that are piloting Logi. And I can already say this is something that I, that will get me into the Corp Projects feature. Automatic payments, goals for Logi pilots. I'll definitely be messing around with that. Um, they're adding ways to mass create them or create them repetitively. So I could set a rep a million hit points goal or, or however it's going to be set up. And then if I want to make another one, I can just duplicate or copy that or, or resume it like a corp ad. And that will definitely cut down on the clicks for this feature, which was greatly appreciated. I loved the, the silence in the room when they announced automatic SRP and then the double silence when they reminded the audience they were supposed to clap and cheer and everybody quietly went, Yay! Because I think, I think they were th the audience was petrified with the idea of automatic SRP. Is my gut instinct right? That like is something that could be exploited. So, the, so everyone in that room probably has some like role within their corp and stuff, and they were probably thinking, "Oh my god, is it safe?" Right. <laughs> uh, hopefully, CCP will take some of the design cues from the various seat and off modules out there that allow you to set limits on the SRP, like SRP above a certain amount or don't SRP certain faction modules or don't SRP the cargo. There are various check, check boxes you can tick off. Um, hopefully that is a thing. Hopefully they allow players to set a percentage of, as well of how much of the ship gets SRP so that, Groups out there that don't have a bunch of budget can make sure that they're setting their spending levels appropriately, and groups that have infinite money, like your goon swarms, can set 1.25% SRP for certain ships, so their Logi pilots actually make money flying Logi. That kind of there's a lot that you could do there. I don't know if CCP will actually do that because I would imagine they want to slot it into the corp projects feature as quickly and painlessly as possible for their first launch. But I think those are the kinds of features that would really drive adoption for SRP because as you've mentioned, it's very abusable, very, very abusable if you just put it in a kind of a dumb, simplified way where it just automatically shells out money if a pilot loses a ship. Some of the bigger alliances might be able to, to sustain that, but even then, probably not if you've got pilots running around with faction fit marauders getting 100% SRP'd. That's going to get turned off real quick. <laughs> yeah, especially when they start collecting their own loot and then selling it back to the alliance. Yes. But it's encouraging, though, like... SRP, especially for larger alliances, the administration of that and the payouts for that can get pretty intensive time and clickwise. So having some kind of automated process to that is very attractive if they can get it right as far as the security side of things. Yeah, I think it's uh, the SCP has been talking about this for a while now, where uh, they have been been saying that the bigger alliances with the IT infrastructure have uh, uh, an advantage over other alliances because to the way meta has developed currently between alliances is uh, you pretty much need to have IT infrastructure in your group to be quite a competitive and actually good group to attract uh, new players. And uh, CCP has been trying to get those 
third party tools more into uh, Eve proper, where uh, you don't need anymore the like you don't need to pay people real money just to be able to play the game properly. They definitely are making strides towards it, right? I mean, th- one of the other things they said during FanFest was all of this work they've done to sort of track how much ore you mine, how many rats you kill, drones you kill, tr- triglavians you kill, etc., um, is going to sort of be handed back over to the EVE players and the people who run Corps to say, well, you can make your own internal tracking systems and reward systems. It's all really, really good news, isn't it? And again, finer control over sort of tax and taxing LP and that sort of stuff. I hope they just continue with with those things they mentioned previously as well, and maybe sneak some of those in um, as time goes along, because these options to customize your corp, it it just every corp I've been in and Eve looks and, and feels different, which is really cool. A little bit of a throwaway line, but they essentially confirmed that space terraforming is what the transmuters are going to be used for. We made that call on the podcast ages ago. I presume that will be some kind of feature added after they test out the pirate corruption mechanics, because I, you know, changing the conditions of the system is explicitly what pirate corruption is going to do. So I figure the Transmuters will probably be sort of a V2 of that in a more player-controlled way, likely for an LSEC. Yeah, they basically said that uh, these things, will we will hand them over to you to use, including the transmuters, right? So I, I can't imagine what else um, they meant by that, because they were definitely implying that other things that they've created recently, uh, other mechanics, other sort of little mini structures and things, are also going to be things that will roll into solve then eventually or roll into other like npc um npc null and things like that and last bit of fan fest news the csm election finally in um we had a much much higher voting turnout this year which i'm reading angry mustaches analysis on reddit had some interesting uh implications for how the voting turned out, but the election is Angry Mustache, Kazanir, Storm Delay, Alcoholic Satan, Luke Anion, Dark Shines, Mike Azariah, The Oz, Mark Resurrectus, and Amelia Duck's Space, elected by popular vote, and CCP's two picks, which is brand new this year, were spent on Kashal Aderon and Stitch Caneland, which was number one on our personal ballots. Yeah, I'm glad Stitch made it onto uh, CCP's ballot as well. Yeah, that was a huge pick. Um, Kishal, if you're not familiar, is a more new player-focused candidate, which Mike was already on there, but I think Mike is more providing resources to new players, while Kishal is more in the providing skill sets and training to new players end of it. Is that a fair assessment, Zero? So is Kishal the... uh... Even better with friends slash fun ink uh, candidates or, or plays the game with those people, right? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I'm not somebody I was familiar with, and um, you know, I know that Kiati ran last year, right, from Fun Ink and uh, Even Better with Friends. Um, Kiati, actually, no, she's uh, eveRookies dot com. Right, right. These are things I've heard of, but not actually had any sort of actual contact with. I haven't messed with eRookies.com either, but I was familiar with it. I know it's a pretty popular new player community. Yeah, I just want to say I am very happy with the, the how elections turned out this year. I'm very happy that uh, we have half of uh, the CSM is no, from no blocks. Which I mean, they will. Uh, they're obviously going to get in, and they need to be in. I think, but also, I'm very happy that we have six other people who are specialized in their own specific things, and are. I would say they're all of them are pretty good at it. And I'm. Uh, I would like to say that I'm quite happy that Stitch finally made in made it into CSM. He has been running for like four years now, I think. 
Yeah, he he definitely deserves it. Um, it's a shame he didn't get elected by popular vote, but I think as far as people that CCP could pick from that list, yeah, huge pick, I think. Really interesting to see how the elections played out. Uh, reading a bit from Angry Mustache's breakdown, uh, Pando getting eliminated seemed to be the, the pivotal moment. Uh, Dark Shine's uh, basically initiative had to split their votes between Pando and Dark Shine's this year. And they definitely prioritized Dark, as you might expect from him being their alliance lead. But the effect of that was Pando getting knocked out and his votes going to Dark Shines to elect him. But the the follow-on effects of that also elected Oz and Mike. So the basically the players that had Pando at their top also had Oz and Mike pretty high, you'd think. If that's the or or at least well, I guess uh, if you're thinking about how the elections work, it's a little more complicated than that. But folks that had Pando up top had at least some to Dark Shines, which elected him. But past that, they either their third place didn't have enough votes to get in, or they actually went to Oz and Mike to get them over the line. Either way, that decision for initiative to run two candidates was very pivotal and had a lot of downstream effects. I'll be honest, it's far too complicated for me. <laughs> yeah, you're like Dujic. Uh, so there are a couple people that got more number one votes than a lot of the folks that ultimately wind up getting, ultimately wound up, excuse me, getting elected. Arhant Sabrisky and Dujic One Eye both got more top spots than Amelia Dusk Space. Torvald and Phantomite both got more top spots than Angry, which actually isn't that surprising given the way Goons votes. Um, Storm Delay only had 819 top spots. So his uh, his vote ad was tremendous from downstream ballots. Very interesting. Um, they, yeah, did, they did promise I encourage they were gonna... you guys, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, to go check out the uh, voting breakdown blogs from CCP Swift and Angry. They're fascinating to watch how the voting dynamics played out. But it's just interesting to note, even though we had like 50% more turnout, a lot of that turnout was either NullSec people or folks only voting for one or two candidates. Those candidates not coming through and their voting power effectively being wasted because they didn't fully fill out their ballot. Okay. They did promise they were going to do the usual kind of uh, long form reveal of the vote, how the votes went sometime next week. Right. So I will watch that. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a must watch stream if you're into the CSM elections and how those mechanics work. But yeah, fascinating. Um, you would think with common electoral wisdom that the amount of vote increase would be a signal that we'd get a more diverse, um, a more diverse CSM than usual with the fewest number of null set candidates because the conventional wisdom is the blocks were already uh, pretty much voting as much as they would ever vote. And the untapped potential is the non-block null sec, low sec, and high sec, and potentially wormhole space, engaging the wormhole players. We're not really seeing that this time around. Um, we did have Mike, Oz, Mark, and Amelia come on, but Mark is getting re-elected. Mike is getting re-elected. Oz and Amelia are the two new faces in the popularly elected bunch. Don't really know that they came at the expense of any block, though. We're still seeing a pretty standard representation of the NullSec candidates. I guess one of them came at the expense of Brave. But beyond that, yeah, not as uh, dramatic a shakeup as you might have expected, being told that there was record turnout. Half of half of the CSM is no block, effectively six of the 12 are, the, are no block. And 
you know, if you take out CCP's cat, CCP's picks, you know, that's six out of ten. And the two of us could have been no blockers down the line. Maybe they were just, you know, so petrified of, pan, of uh, Phantomite going on that it just skewed all of their ballots. And, uh, you know, they, they just sort of ended up outplaying themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Phantomite's an interesting one. Um, I'd be really interested to see how he and Torvald's ballots played out in the really detailed breakdown. Like, who did their voters wind up putting first, second, third, fourth, etc.? Because they both of them got lower a lower number of top spot votes than Amelia, but Amelia didn't get enough to overcome Dujic one eye. So it is possible their voting power act did wind up benefiting him. So I don't know who else they would have you know, those are usually low sec faction warfare type players. I imagine they would have had a lot of people putting them in their top spot with the other person in the second spot. But if both of them get knocked out, who does that third spot go to? That's going to be the big question. I think most of the Phantomite voters are people that follow Phantomite themselves. You know, people who know what Phantomite stands for, which is, you know, stuff about structure warfare, um, stuff about ANSI Blex projection and just stuff about getting back to the real Eve kind of kind of stuff, uh, you know, fighting people. <laughs> Lots of um, incentives to change the game in a drastic way to make it more violent and things. And I imagine that uh, those sorts of people would put people like Amelia um, below Phantomite on their ballot. Yeah, Amelia is elected in the final round, apparently with the next person out being Dujic, who lost by about 400 votes. I think it speaks generally, though, to the fact that the game, when I first joined the game, it felt like it was, okay, a pathway to null sec. It was kind of what you were on. And some people went off and stayed in high sec and did something interesting. Some people went to wormholes, and some people did something else. Uh, now it feels like null sec, living in solve null, is just one option. And for new players, there's a lot more that, that keeps them hanging around in uh, other types of space, I think. And especially with these uh, the Faction Warfare expansion, I think there were even people that left uh, their Sovnal and uh, actually went and, and did something completely different in, in uh, Faction Warfare. And I, I, that's what I, it feels like for me is, you know, we ended up with, like, the, the player base is a more sort of uh, diverse group nowadays is what I, the feeling I get. At least the ones who have Omega and will vote, right? Because maybe before you had like more Omega accounts in now. Now it feels like those Omega accounts are more spread out. Yep, definitely. I would say definitely the ratio of players that are that reside in Nullsec and that reside in other spaces have uh, widened. Then way more people are now li not living in Nullsec and not part of the null solve. I think that's healthier for the game. <laughs>